Let us pray. Father, we bless your name for this day. We thank you because you've given us this privilege to gather around the table of the Lord again and break the bread, share the word, so that our hungry, thirsty souls can be fed. We praise you for your greatness and we adore you because of who you are. We pray that you reveal yourself more to us this day, that the revelation of yourself will make us go deeper in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. We have learned very much about Stephen, one of the seven people that were chosen to take care of a particular area of the work in the early church. Well, I just remind you of his life, his ministry, his gifts from Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. In verse 6, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now particularly on Stephen, look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. God himself chose Stephen. But by the instrumentality of the decision of the congregation and then the laying on, on of hands of the apostles, he was one of the seven. He was the first one named among all the seven. We're told about his ministry, that his ministry was full of the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. He was always under the control of the Holy Ghost and he was always moved by the power of the Holy Ghost. We're told he was a man of great faith, a man who wrought great wonders and miracles among the people. He was not only a worker in the church, he was also a dynamic preacher in the public. He was submissive in the church to the leaders, to the apostles in the church. But then he was also very dynamic in the public as he shared the word of God and his testimony. And the people that listened to him, they felt the power. They also saw the glory of God. In verse 9 of Acts chapter 6, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He spoke so convincingly, so authoritatively, and he spoke so in line with the Bible, that in all the questions they put forth, they were not able to resist the wisdom of his answer. And they were not able to resist the fervency of his spirit. But then they did not all like or accept what he said. Because of this, they got false witnesses. And they accused him of four different things. All those four different things related with his preaching. They accused him of speaking blasphemous words against God, against Moses, against the law and against the temple. And these are four areas very, very dear to the heart of the Israelites. God, Moses, the law and the temple. 
and in all these four delicate areas, they accused Stephen that he had been speaking blasphemy. And that means they wanted to take away his life. But now before that, they would allow him to answer for himself, to answer against the accusation. Look at verse 11. Then the servant men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place the temple and the law for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. That was the accusation. But it was a high-handed, great accusation leveled against Stephen. And here he was standing alone. The apostles were not allowed to come and answer for him. And all the other disciples in the church who greatly respected the ministry, the life, and the gifts of Stephen. They were not allowed to stay by him. But Jesus Christ had said before he left that he'll bring you before counselors and before councils and before governors so that you'll be able to give an answer to your faith as a testimony against them. But then do not predetermine what you will say because the spirit of your father in you will speak through you and the time had now come and Jesus was to fulfill his promise because he had said that you go into all the world you preach the gospel to every creature teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you even to the end of the world now Stephen was brought before the council and they had leveled this accusation against him. Remember, these are accusations that were very, very delicate in the heart of every Jew because they talked about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And, and these people now accused Stephen. They said, oh yes, he's mentioning God, but not the God of Israel. He is speaking against the God we know, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is presenting a Jesus. That's the way they put it. He is presenting this Jesus and he's saying that Jesus will come to destroy what the God of heaven had given unto us. Not only that, Moses, who had been regarded as the greatest prophet that ever lived in the history of the Israelites. And they reverenced him, they honored him, they remembered him with great honor. They said he was speaking against that Moses. Not only that, the temple that had taken them years to build, the temple where all their sacrifices were made, the temple where they expected that was the only place that their sacrifice, their worship could be acceptable to God. They said they spoke against that. Not only that, the law given to them by the ministration of angels, the law that they highly valued, they said he was speaking against that law. There was no other criminal as great as Stephen in their eyes. Because he had touched them where they were sensitive. God, Moses, temple, law. Different things. Four things that were sensitive and delicate to them. So they called him. And he said, you must give an answer to all these accusations. Now look at chapter 6, verse 15. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. He had not talked. 
but the glory of God, the power of God, the anointing of God, the evidence and testimony and confirmation from above rested upon him. Isn't that what we are told in the epistle of Peter to the saints of God? That when you are persecuted, you bear it patiently because the spirit of glory and of God abides on such a person. And here Stephen appearing before the council. And as they looked steadfastly on him, they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And in chapter 7 verse 1, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? Stephen, what do you say to this? We hear you speaking against God, against Moses, against the temple, against the law. What do you say to that? Are these things so? In 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. As Christians, as believers, we should be able to meet accusation or the lies of the enemies or the questioning of opposers with scripture, with the spirit of God, with humility, with love, with meekness, with fear. And whenever we give the answer, the answer ought to be clear, ought to be coherent, ought to be consistent with the scripture. And um, as we study Acts chapter 7, I want you to see that this man, Philip, was a man of scripture. He had studied the scriptures. He was saturated with the scriptures. And without any preparation of an outline before him, as they called him, with all the enemies accusing him before him, he took the steps one by one. And he answered the accusation that he said he spoke, number one, against God. Number two, the one they said he spoke against him, Moses, he cleared it up. Number three, the one they said he spoke against the temple. And number four, the one they said he spoke against the law. And do you know this? That Stephen, as he spoke, he spoke in the most logical sequence you could ever dream of. And he talked convincingly, authoritatively, about God. But you see, in, in his speaking, you must understand that this wasn't a normal, regular congregation. Now, preachers in training are taught how to preach. And in how to preach, we are told there must be an introduction. And preachers are told that when you are making your introduction, if the introduction is not interesting and arresting, you lose the congregation in the very first five minutes because they see that what you are saying is not interesting to the audience. And Stephen now is giving a message, a dynamic message, in answer to the accusation of the enemies, and his introduction is interesting. You know people are interested when you talk about them. Have you ever noticed uh, people, you are talking about what they like, what they love, they are very interested. And even though Stephen was answering an accusation, he answered in an interesting manner because he was talking about the history of Israel. He related their history to them and they liked to hear about themselves. It was an interesting point. Not only that. Step by step, he was talking about God and he related with them the God that he served. And in trying to do that, he did it in such a way that he weaved the attributes of God, the greatness of God, with the story of the preservation of the children of Israel. That's why they listened. 
Not only that, every preacher must use every opportunity to talk about Jesus, the Messiah, Christ, the Savior. And do you know every step, every step, point upon point, he was building up a great message that climaxed on Jesus Christ, the Savior. But as the accusation divided into four sections, he picked up from the first section about God. Now, think about this. God, Moses, the temple, the law, which is the greatest? Which is the greatest? God. And that's the point where he starts. He picked up the greatest point whereby they have accused him and he answered that part. Now, when they asked him the question in chapter 7 verse 1, then said the high priest, are these things so? And now he talks about God. Now, it's a long sermon because there are 53 verses of solid Bible teaching that he gives before he tries to give his, con his conclusion and they just rose up upon him they couldn't bear the word of God but I'll just uh, give you 16 verses today and he talks about the glory of God the grace of God the goodness of God and the greatness of God and what a message the glory the grace the goodness the greatness all of God. Now verse 2. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. Stop there. Now, when they are calling you a criminal, you don't talk like that. When they call you a criminal who has spoken blasphemous words, you don't stand up with your shoulders up, with your head up, and you say, Men, brethren, fathers, I have a message. Listen to me, hearken. This man was bold. This man was full of the Holy Ghost. This man was full of power. Already they saw his face shining. They saw the glory of God upon him. And you know what he said in verse 2? The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. What's Stephen saying? Stephen is saying, as you look at me, you see something. As you look at me, you see that my face had been shining as the face of an angel. But what is that? Is that not the glory of God that shone on the face of Moses? Is that not the glory of God that shone in the Shekinah glory in the temple of God? I am not against God. If I were against God, the glory of God will not be upon me. The same glory on Moses, the same glory in the temple, the same glory that appeared at the time of the giving of the law. And that God of glory, you see the connection? He wanted them to understand what they saw he was going to speak about. And yet, he pointed attention to the glory of God upon him without directly mentioning it. And he was going to talk about the glory of God which they were seeing and beholding. And yet, he was going to talk about Abraham, their father. He was going to talk about Isaac, about Jacob. You see, when you are called a preacher, you must have the wisdom of God. And that is the reason we've been talking on the gifts of the Spirit all these past weeks. And you can see it again here now as Stephen was beginning to give the message. And he said, the God of glory appeared unto not your father, Abraham, our father. He identified with them. That's good preaching. Identifying with the congregation. He said, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Karan. Now, there are accuse this man of showing disrespect to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, showing disrespect to the writing of the law, disrespect to the lawgiver, to the leader of Israel, Moses, disrespect to the temple. And here he shows respect to the men, brethren and the fathers, shows respect to the God of glory and to our father Abraham. 
And as he began to talk, he told them in that verse 2 that the God he believes in is the God of glory. Now, what does that mean? When it says the God of glory, all the attributes of God are summed up in that word glory. Now, follow me through the scriptures. In Exodus chapter 15, verses 1, 2, and 6. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. That's the word the horse and his rider as he thrown into the sea. To an Israelite, when you talked of the God of glory, you talked of the God of power. You talked of God, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah God, our banner, the one who gives us victory. So as uh, Stephen was saying, the God of glory, all the people there, members of the Sanhedrin, the council, the high priest, and all the temple worshippers that listen, they said, after all, this man believes in that same God, the God of power, the God of glory, the God who triumphs over the enemies. Look at verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. In verse 6, thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy. So, when Stephen said the God of glory, what was he saying? He's saying the God I believe in is the God of battle, the God of power, the God who overcomes in every battle for the children of God is the God who is the supreme one, the ultimate one, the final, the final one in authority. And whatever Satan may do today, and whatever you in the council may do today, at last, that God of glory will reign, because he's going to reign forever and ever. And you see, in that same Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. When you say the God of glory, you mean the God of power. You also mean the God of holiness, the God of justice. That you sit here to examine me. You sit here to accuse me. And you are defending God. But do you realize that that God is the God of power? Who can put down the enmity, however high, however, however deep it may be? Do you know that God is a God of holiness? So if you're sitting here to judge me and to defend that God, make sure that your defense of God and your, your quarreling against me is according to holiness and truth. Because you know the God of glory is the God of power, is the God of holiness. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Verse 58. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. That glory was also something manifested in the name. You see, it's connected with the power of God with the holiness of God, and with the name of God. In Psalm 145, verse 5, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous words. So when you talk of the God of glory, you are talking of the attributes of God. You are talking of the power, the holiness, the name, the majesty. Verse 12, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and glorious majesty of his kingdom. And in Psalm 111, 111 verse 3, 
His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endureth forever. So then, Stephen had been accused that he was speaking against God. And they said, Stephen, what do you say? Tell us something about God, if you really believe God. He said, well, the God I believe in is the God of glory, the God of power, the God of holiness, the Lord whose name is great and his majesty is glorious and his works glorious. How about you, the accusation that um, you say that one Jesus will come and that Jesus will change the customs that has been delivered unto us indirectly. Stephen was saying, yes, that's the very point I'm making. That this glory was revealed on Moses. This glory was revealed in the temple. This glory was revealed in the giving of the law. But the fullness of that glory of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself by himself purged our sins he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now look up here. There is much to learn on how to preach in the Bible. Because the word of God, the Bible, gives us the message of the preacher, the method of the preacher, the motivation for preaching, and also the methodology in preaching. Now, you see, when you read the Bible, you see preachers, and you see preachers that preached the truth, and they preached the truth convincingly to convict the sinners of their need. I've just told you now that this is Stephen, he linked up what can be seen upon him with what he was saying. That's important in preaching. You see, many times we don't start with the preaching. Many times we have a singing, we have praying, we have fellowship, we have worship, we have a special choir singing, we have many, many things. Then the preaching comes, and the preacher must go along and walk along with all that the people had already seen in the congregation since the service started. And you see, they saw the glory upon him. They saw the shining face upon him. And now he was starting his message, and he must pick up from that. And he must pick up from the God of glory. Next time you have an opportunity to preach, you must go through that. You don't go against what had already been seen by the audience in the congregation while you're starting the message. Not only that. You see, he didn't explain all these things I'm explaining to you now about the glory of God. He was going to reserve that till the end. It is because we're studying. That's why I need, I need to give you everything. The meaning and interpretation of what he's saying. He started by saying, the God of glory. And everybody sat down. Everybody looked at him. Everybody listened because he was talking about something that was really fantastic. The God of glory, the God of power, the God of holiness, the God of a great name, the God of majesty, the God of wondrous works, and the God whose glory became fulfilled and full in Jesus Christ. Now, he's talking about the glory of God. How about the grace of God? In verse 3. And said unto him, that is, he said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and of thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he, that is Abraham, out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charan. And from thence, when his father was dead, 
he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. Now, this um, Stephen has talked about the glory of God. He's not going to talk about his grace. The grace and the call of God. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. So Abraham was a sinner. But you see that Stephen did not directly say that. Think about it. As it was before the accusers. If he said, God is a God of grace and is calling you who are sitting before me like he called Abraham. Do you know Abraham was a sinner? Right at, at that point, they will stop him and stone him. Talking about Abraham as a sinner and talking about God giving him grace and calling him out of idolatry, out of sin, calling Abraham our father, a sinner. No, he didn't do that. He just mentioned the point, the God of glory called Abraham of idolatry, out of idolatry, and he transferred him to another place, the grace of God, without directly saying Abraham was a sinner, like you are sinners. There is wisdom in preaching. If he had um, he just said it directly, talking about the grace of God, he would have lost the chance right there. But he said, God called him. And he said, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Where was that? Genesis chapter 12. From verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land which that I will show thee. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God that singled out Abraham. The same grace that singled you out of your own family and called you. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While you were in sin, while you were in idolatry, how God in his majestic glory, how God in his abundant grace called you and said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And he promised you abundant blessings because of his grace. It was that same grace that called unto Abraham and said, Come out. What is that? That's repentance. When you tell a man to repent, you tell him to come out of drinking, out of evil, out of immorality. Another word for repentance is come out. And he was telling Abraham, repent, come out. And then if you come out, I'll be giving you my blessing in verse 2. And I will make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And cause him that causes thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Abraham answered that call. In Genesis chapter 15, from verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, They shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said, So shalt thy seed be. Verse 6, And he believed in the Lord. What shall I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord, and thou shalt be saved, and thine whole house. And he believed in the Lord. 
to as many as believed, as many as received him, he gave them power to become the sons of God, even as many as believed on his name. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. In Romans chapter 4, from verse 1, Romans chapter 4, from verse 1. What shall we say then, that Abraham, our father, pertaining to the flesh, has found? In all this that we're reading, about the grace of God in calling Abraham, when he told him, come out of your land, come out of your kindred, come out of your people, in other words, leave your former ways and come and follow me. What shall we say then, that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh has found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. But for what says the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that walketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. When God called him, it was the God of grace, the God of love, the God of mercy calling him. And he responded to that call. And that is what Stephen was reminding the council of. He said, if you question me about God, the God I believe is the God of glory, the God of power, the God of grace, and the God of all majesty, the God in battle, the God of victory. And it is, you examine me about my relationship with Israel. In fact, Abraham is our father together. But this is what I believe, that God called Abraham by his grace. Do you know that already he was telling them it's not of works, it's not of the washings of cup, washing the hands, washing the elbow. Indirectly already he was telling them it is by faith, it is by grace. Because Abraham, that we call our father, he received righteousness by the grace of God. The Lord called him. Now he talked about the glory of God, he talked about the grace of God. He's also going to talk about the goodness of God. In Acts chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 5. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for an inheritance and to his seed after him, when as yet... He had no child. What's Stephen saying? Stephen is saying, known unto God are all his works from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. That even when Abraham, this Abraham our father, had no child, when Abraham had no body to inherit from him, God promised him the inheritance of the land as a possession. And he said, I will give it to your seed after, after you. When as yet he had no child. He's still talking about the God of power, the God of impossibilities, who is able to give child to Abraham at the old age. He's talking about God we ought to have faith in, who knows no difficulty, no impossibility. Every mountain before him shall vanish away. He's talking about the God of power, who is able to overcome every hindrance in the body and is able to heal. He's talking about the God who can promise even the land while that man was just a stranger on that land. And then he says in verse, in verse 6, And God spake on this wise. Look up here. They accused him that he didn't believe in God. He was speaking against God. In verse 2, he mentioned God, the God of glory. In verse 6, he mentioned God. In verse 7, he mentioned God. In verse 9, he mentioned God. And then he goes on like that till the end, mentioning God. And he just mentioned God so many times. They said, now we know that you believe in that God. That's what they accused him of. 
that he did not believe in the real God, in the true God, and many times he used he, him for that God. And then he says in verse 6, And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation, to whom they shall be in bondage, will I judge, said God. And after that, shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Which place? This place. What does that mean? Chapter 6, verse 13. And set up witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. Stephen knew what he was doing. He didn't directly say temple or tabernacle or wilderness, but this place. You accuse me of uh, not believing we should worship God in this place. That's wrong. In fact, when God delivered his own uh, children, the children of Israel, he delivered them so they can come and serve me in this place. But then, if they are going to serve acceptably, they must serve according to what he wants them to do. They must not serve according to the temporary uh, giving of what has passed away, what is abolished. They must serve as his own begotten son has come to show us it is, there is nothing wrong in this place. What is wrong is what you do in this place. You know, Stephen was already laying this sin on them, but he didn't know it already. But therefore, they were they just quiet and they were listening to him. You see, nobody interrupted him. And in verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac. Does he really believe also in Isaac? And circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. Does he believe that? And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. There we are. He has now got them settled. He said, well, I've been talking to you of the God of glory, the God of power, the God of holiness, the God of all majesty, the God of wondrous works, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. What do I believe about Israel? I believe that Israel came out of the twelve patriarchs. But now verse 9. You see, this man, Stephen, with the wisdom of God, he presented the message. And he told them that he believed in God. He told them he was serving that same God and that he believed that that God is good. He was good to Abraham and he's been good to all the people that were serving him. And it is also good to those who will be serving him today. Let me share with you a little of the goodness of God in Psalm 33. Psalm 33, faithful in, in fulfilling his promises, faithful in giving us what he has said he will give, like he was faithful to Abraham, he is faithful to everyone. Psalm 33, verse 5, he loveth righteousness and judgment, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And you've seen it in Abraham? How God preserved Abraham when he dwelt in a strange land, the Lord is good. You've seen it in Isaac, how Isaac was provided for when they stopped all that uh, pertained unto him, yet the Lord made him to come on top, victorious every time, the Lord is good. You've seen how Jacob would have been killed and destroyed by Esau, and yet the God of glory preserved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord is good. You have seen also the twelve patriarchs, when they would have died of farming with, um, with uh, Jacob, their father, but the Lord preserved them, the Lord is good. The Lord loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. In Psalm 65, Psalm 65, verse 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy cause. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. 
that's still telling us the Lord is good. Psalm 145, verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The Lord is good to all. In Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. The members of the Sanhedrin and the council were very proud of Israel because that was a nation like no other nation. The council, the fathers, the brethren that were sitting before Stephen, they were very proud of Israel. They loved Israel, that special nation, that peculiar nation. And they said, every time they said, the Lord is good to Israel, like, like to no other nation. Because there is no other nation that God has chosen, that God has drawn nearer unto, up, up until the time Jesus came, like the children of Israel. It was only when Jesus came, he faced the Gentiles, and he brought the light also to the Gentiles, to those that sat in darkness. But then all the children of Israel had been singing Psalm 73 all the time, and they rejoiced in it. Truly the Lord God is good unto Israel. And uh, Stephen was telling them, I agree with you, the Lord is good to Israel, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to the twelve patriarchs. So you can see how he was developing his message. But now in verse 9, Acts chapter 7. Verse 9, the greatness of God. He has touched on the glory, on the grace, on the goodness of the Lord. Now, the greatness of God. And the patriarch moved with envy and sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. What was Stephen saying? Understand what I'm telling you from the message of Stephen. Stephen was building up a message. And I've told you that preachers are trained to build up a message. And, uh, you know, your message is in different, different parts. But your message will come to a climax when you bring about the objective or the motive or the sharpest point of your message when you bring it to focus upon the congregation. What was the focus of the message of Stephen? Jesus Christ. And it's building up. He didn't start with that name. If he started with that name, everybody will just rise up and just lynch him, just destroy him. That wasn't where to start. But he knew what he was doing. And he was going to bring the conclusion later when he'll be talking about Jesus Christ, about the Messiah, and about salvation in the Lord. The patriarchs moved with envy and they sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. You know what he's saying? You have killed Jesus Christ. He's still going to say that later, but not now, but that's what he means. You've killed Jesus Christ because you have moved with envy. That's not new. The patriarchs, the fathers, the real foundation of Israel. That is how they were moved with envy and they sold Joseph. But God was with him. And he raised up that Joseph from the lowest prison to the highest place. And haven't you moved with the envy? Haven't you killed Jesus Christ, lowered him to the sepulchre? And that same God was with him and he has raised him from the sepulchre to the highest throne. You know, it's making a point. About this Joseph, you should know the story, but um, nowadays they don't uh, teach in our schools. They don't teach everybody all these Bible stories. So there may be people here who don't know the story about Joseph. I don't want you to raise up your hand if you don't know. So I will remind you. And for those who know the story of Joseph, I just refresh your mind. Now, Stephen is talking about Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. 
from verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said to one another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Come now therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some peace. And we will say, Some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what, what will become of his dreams. And in verse 23, And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of the Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spice tree and balm and mire, going to carry each down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and conceal his blood. Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren was content. Then there passed by Midianites, the merchant men, and he drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. That's what Stephen was saying. Out of envy, out of hatred, they sold him. Now come to Genesis chapter 39, verse 21. Genesis chapter 39 verse 21 but the Lord was with him and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison in chapter 41 verse 14 then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it, and I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand the dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh told him the dream, and then he interpreted the dream as a result of the interpretation and the counseling that Joseph gave unto Pharaoh. Look at the consequence in that same chapter, verse 38. That same chapter, verse 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none to, uh, so discreet and wise as thou art that thou shalt be over my house and according unto my word shall all my people be ruled only in the throne will I be greater than thou and Pharaoh said unto Joseph see I have set thee over all the land of Egypt is that not the work of God that's the greatness of God a man, they said, would have died. He didn't die. God revealed to him dreams. Those dreams were special. And those dreams were to be fulfilled. But these people that moved with envy, they said, well, we'll get rid of him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. But because the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of all goodness and the God of power, the victorious, triumphant God in battle, the God of holiness, the faithful God, because they will not forget his promise, he manifested his great power. That's what Stephen was saying, that the God he believed in was the God that whenever he decided anything, either on Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, nobody can stand against it. Or he determined it upon Joseph, nobody can go against it. Or if he determines it upon Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Savior, nobody will be able to go against it successfully. And so he talked about the history of the children of Israel, but very, very carefully. As he was talking about the history of the children of Israel, he was defending the attributes of God. 
the power of God, the majesty of God. The God they said he did not believe in. That was uh, the point he was defending as he was relating this history. And you know, you should have confidence in God. Because this God we're serving, he can never disappoint you. The devil may be against you. Enemies may be against you. And even persecutors may just relegate you to the background. But this God we're serving is the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of goodness, and the God that is great. He will never disappoint you. Let me just quickly show you the story of the life of this, David, of this Joseph. In uh, chapter 42, verses 1 to 3. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence, that we may eat and die not. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. Now this is um, a wonderful story and a wonderful account. You'll need to read it yourself. That is to read all these chapters from chapter 40 uh, to chapter 50. And as you read everything, you'll see the story of Joseph there. Now, let's see chapter 45. Verses 1 to 5. Then Joseph could not refrain himself. Before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, and he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me thither. For God, the God of glory, for God, the God of grace, God, the God of all goodness, God, the great God, the great God of power, the great God of holiness, the great God of majesty, the great God of wondrous works, did send me before you to preserve life. Come back to Acts chapter 7. And let's see from verse 9 now. Acts chapter 7 verse 9. And the patriarchs moved with them, be sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. That's what I've been reading to you in Genesis. Now there came a deer over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. At the second time. At the second time. Look up here. There are many areas of stories in the Old Testament that Stephen could have picked up and used. Why was he particularly using the story about Abraham, about Isaac, about Jacob, about the twelve patriarchs, and about Joseph? You know, he wanted to present Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, according to the flesh, the son of Abraham. Because God has said, out of the family of Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Because according to his promise, a seed shall come out of that man, Abraham. That's Jesus Christ. That's why he's, he's particularly choosing Abraham. How about Isaac? You remember Isaac? The only begotten son of his father, Abraham? And Abraham taking that son, going to sacrifice him. 
and asking a question, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham saying, God shall provide himself a, sac a lamb for the sacrifice. How that related to the life of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that Jacob as well? How Jacob was going into a strange land. And while he was going, he dreamt a dream. And then he saw a ladder from earth to heaven. And the angels of God were going on, going down and going up. When he woke up, he said, God is in this place. And I knew it not. You remember Jesus talking to Nathaniel, saying, You've seen nothing yet. Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man. Now you see Joseph in the prison, but lifted up to the throne. You've seen Jesus Christ in the same way um, that was accused because of envy and killed, but raised up by the Lord God of heaven. Now, he's choosing his material so that eventually they will be able to see that Jesus Christ was not a strange figure. That Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, and everything that happened to him, you could find similar things in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve patriarchs, and Joseph. Now, it says in this verse, verse 13, And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. Look up here. Stephen was a marvelous preacher. You know what he was saying indirectly? He's not giving them the conclusion yet, but what he's saying is this. I'm not surprised that Jesus came the first time you rejected him. At the second time, you will know him. Because, you know, even the patriarchs, the people of God, the people of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, it is the name Jacob that is later changed to Israel. Even those sons of Israel, sons of Jacob, they did not know Joseph except until the second time. And Jesus has come the first time. You did not recognize him, but he's coming the second time. When he comes the second time, all Israel, they will recognize him. And with tears, they will look on him. Whom they have pierced. Look at that verse 13. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. And Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him. And all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. So jo Jacob went down into Egypt and died he and our fathers. And were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emo, the father of Shechem. You say, where does he go from there? How does he bring the message to convict them? How does he eventually from all this story talk about Jesus Christ? If you want to know that, you'll have to come next Monday. Because, you know, we cannot finish everything today. Next Monday, we'll be going from verse 17. Before you put your outline away, I've not finished. Before you open your bag to get ready to go home, listen to me. I've been talking about God. And think about it. This is the God we're serving. The God of glory. The God of power. The God of majesty. If you are thinking about how small you are, think about how great your God is. If you think about how weak you are, think about how powerful your God is. If you think there are too many enemies standing and staying around you, think about the God, Jehovah Nisi, the God, our victor, the God that triumphs over every enemy. If that is the God you are serving, you may go into a dungeon like Joseph, you'll come to the throne like Joseph. It may appear that the enemies are getting an upper hand, but God is the God of impossibilities. He is the great God. Let me give you the promise of God before you go. In Deuteronomy, chapter 33. Deuteronomy, chapter 33, verse 25. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. What does that mean? 
You don't care for the serpents, for the scorpions, for the evil spirits, for the witches, for the wizards. You tread upon them because thy shoes shall be iron and brass. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, that's another name for Israel, who rideth upon the heaven in thy hell, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. That's why you cannot fall. That's why if you put your life in the hands of God, you cannot perish. That's why there is no enemy to fear. That is why there is no nightmares, there is no pestilence to fear because the eternal God is your refuge and underneath you to support you are the everlasting arms. Take that promise with you everywhere you go and nothing shall be able to defeat you. Is the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of goodness, and the God of all majesty and greatness. That's the God you are serving. Be bold in your God. Rise up and let us pray. Talk to God. The God of glory. The God of all grace.